still waiting just a minute or two for other people to join us. If you're watching live on the YouTube stream, we're glad that you are here. You may, of course, continue to watch on the YouTube stream, but if you prefer to be a part of the discussion, there is a Zoom webinar, and the link to that Zoom webinar is available in our church's weekly newsletter. You might have received that in your inbox this week, and if not, you can find it on our church's homepage, but it would certainly be a treat to have you join us in the Zoom webinar so that you can ask questions. But if you're comfortable watching on YouTube, you certainly may continue to do that. I have 10 o'clock, so let's get started. And as people continue perhaps to trickle in, we'll catch them up. Let's begin with a prayer. Let's begin with a collect for Transfiguration, the day of the Transfiguration. It's, uh, it's a mouthful of a collect, but a beautiful prayer that we don't say often enough. So let me read. Uh, this prayer. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O oh God, who on the holy mount revealed to chosen witnesses your well-beloved Son, wonderfully transfigured in raiment white and glistening, mercifully grant that we, being delivered from the disquietude of this world, may by faith behold the King in his beauty who with you, O Father, and you, O Holy Spirit, lives and reigns one God forever and ever. Amen. Again, welcome to our adult forum today. Today's topic is the transfiguration. It's a one-time presentation in order for us to sync up with the start of our program year. Next Sunday, I will begin a new series on science and theology. But uh, this week, we are looking at the Transfiguration, kind of a one-time event. Um, again, if you're watching on YouTube, you may join in the Zoom webinar so that you can participate in the discussion. You can find a link to the webinar on uh, in our church's newsletter that was sent out this past Thursday. You can find that newsletter either in your inbox or from the church's webpage. But however you're joining us, I'm glad that you are here. I want to start not with transfiguration, but I want to start with baptism because uh, the Sunday when uh, we observe the Feast of the Transfiguration, that's normally a baptismal Sunday. In fact, it's because of baptism that we would seek uh, the bishop's permission to observe transfiguration on a Sunday. So I'd like to start with baptism because I think that's a good way for us to get in to the subject of the transfiguration. So I hope you can see on the screen from the prayer book. This is uh, from, uh, from the right after the service of baptism in the prayer book. And I want to pay particular attention to just this first paragraph um, and, and maybe the beginning of the second paragraph as we read these instructions for baptism. This is what our prayer book teaches us about when baptisms are appropriate. Holy baptism is especially appropriate at the Easter Vigil, on the day of Pentecost, on All Saints Day or the Sunday after All Saints Day, and on the Feast of the Baptism of Our Lord, the first Sunday after the Epiphany. It is recommended that as far as possible, baptisms be reserved for these occasions or when a bishop is present. Uh, that means that the prayer book has in mind for us that we would wait until these particular occasions to celebrate baptism. Now, I think there are two reasons that the prayer book does this. Um, first, as a response to, and one might even say as a correction to, the normative practice before the 79 prayer book was adopted. Uh, this prayer book wants us to move baptism from a private family event to a public congregational event. Uh, in uh, the old prayer book, and in most congregations, back when we were using the old prayer book, baptism was something that happened 
in private. It happened either before or after their Sunday service when the family would gather at the Father and the Baptistry for a quiet baptism because it was understood to be an event for just the individual being baptized, that this individual was being baptized into the body of Christ. But the church, of course, has long understood that you're not baptized in isolation. You're baptized into a community, into a body, into the body of Christ. And so if that baptism is going to be fully uh, uh, meaningful, at least the experience of the baptism, then the body needs to be assembled. And so the first reason that I think the prayer book invites us to limit baptism to those of five occasions is in order that the congregation would gather. These are big days. The Easter Vigil, Pentecost, All Saints, Baptism of our Lord, or when the bishops here, those are big days, days when the congregation is likely to assemble. This is not the second Sunday in August when people are still going to the beach and not able to be in church. This is a, a big public event. Uh, and so that's, that's the first piece. The second piece, of course, is that those days are days when the lessons that we will read, the prayers that we will say, the hymns that we will sing, the whole content of our worship is inclined to uh, express baptism. Easter vigils, uh, red, uh, crossing through the Red Sea, moving from death to life. Pentecost, of course, the coming down of the Holy Spirit, All Saints Day, becoming a saint of God. Um, the baptism of our Lord, you don't even need to uh, imagine that. When the bishop's here, the bishop uh, is usually doing confirmations and reminding us of our participation in the universal church, the Catholic church. Those are occasions when baptism feels right, it is right. At a church like St. Paul's, though, we run out of days. We, we are full on those five days. Easter Vigil, All Saints, Pentecost, Feast of the Baptism, and the Wishes here. That's only five. We need more than that. And, and our practice has been to add a sixth day, a sixth big feast. Now, the prayer book is clear to us in that paragraph that reserving it uh, for these occasions is a recommendation, which means we could do a baptism any Sunday, any day we want to. But in order to hold on to the spirit of that rubric, in order to express as a congregation uh, what that is asking of us, we have traditionally celebrated public baptisms on the day of the transfiguration. The day of the transfiguration, uh, as it is usually transferred for us to a Sunday. Now, some of you a rubrical uh, nerds like me uh, might bristle at that because actually, we're not supposed to transfer the Feast of the Transfiguration to a Sunday. It's one of those days that doesn't get moved to a Sunday. But we, uh, according to the rubrics, ask the bishop for permission to do that transference in order that our lessons and the celebration might be appropriate for a public baptism. I'm going to flip digitally in the prayer book to page, fifth, uh, page 16 of the prayer book now, and I want you to see here uh, that uh, this this little rubric, this is from the, the calendar, um, from the church's calendar, and you'll see, this is talking about major feasts. All Sundays of the year are feasts of our Lord Jesus Christ. So whatever happens on a Sunday matters. Sundays matter. Uh, if if St. Matthew's Day falls on a Sunday, St. Matthew gets bumped because Sunday comes first. The Lord comes first. Jesus comes first. There are only three uh, peculiar days uh, in addition to the seven principal feasts. There are only these particular days that if they fall on a Sunday, we bump Sunday in order to observe these. And they are these three here on your screen. The Holy Name, which is January 1st, the Presentation, which is February 2nd, and the Transfiguration, which is August 6th. So our church understands that these three, along with the seven principal feasts, that's Christmas, Easter, All Saints, Trinity Sunday, um, Pentecost, Epiphany, uh, and one other one that I can't remember right now. Um, uh, in a, in a Easter, uh, in a, if I didn't say it, in addition to those seven, these three take precedent. So if, the, if, if these fall on a Sunday, then whatever the normal Sunday would be, that gets bumped. We skip that this year and we observe it. And so you'll see that the Transfiguration is one of those feasts that if it falls on a Sunday, takes place of a Sunday. But when it doesn't fall on a Sunday, we normally wouldn't move it. We normally wouldn't uh, move it. But on the very next page, if I can get to the next page, You'll see right here at the bottom of this page, where is it? Oh, maybe it's on the next page. Yes. Well, I think I was right the first time. Um, where is it? Somewhere in here, now that I'm looking for it, I can't find it. 
but let me see. Somewhere in here, and I'll find it while we're talking. Somewhere in here, I'll find that um, with uh, sufficient reason or uh, uh, with and with permission of the bishop, um, we are allowed to observe days. Let me go to whole page because then I'll be able to see it. Now I really want to find it, right? Um, where is it? You might be able to see it. It might just be, uh, I might just be missing it. Oh, here it is. Yes, back on the uh, same page we started in, right here. Um, let me make that bigger for you. Um, with express permission of the bishop. And for urgent and sufficient reasons, some other special occasion may be observed on a Sunday. And that's what we do. We, we say to the bishop, we've got sufficient reason. We need a day for public baptism. We think transfiguration works. Um, and so we, we ask for the bishop's permission. So as we begin our conversation about transfiguration, about the feast, um, I want you to have in mind that as a congregation, we primarily engage the feast of the transfiguration as a Sunday observance when baptisms would be appropriate. And so as we read the lessons for transfiguration, as we talk about the theology of transfiguration, as we look at some of the art associated with the transfiguration, I want you to keep in mind that baptismal uh, identity and ask yourself, what is it about this that makes baptism appropriate? Or another way to ask that same question, what, what, what is it about baptism that helps us understand the Feast of the Transfiguration more fully? I'm going to pause there for a moment and uh, mention again that if you're taking part on YouTube and you want to be a part of the discussion, navigate over to the Zoom webinar. You can find a link to the webinar in the church's newsletter, which you can find on the church's homepage. If you are in the Zoom webinar and you have a question, the Q&A feature is the best way to get that to me. Whenever you type in your question, I get a little notice on my screen that says someone has a question. Um, and then I'll, I'll get to that when, when time allows. So whether it's a comment or a question, I can't see your hand raised, but if you'll use the Q&A feature, that allows me to see if you have questions. Uh, anybody have a question or a comment about the, the fact that we observe the transfiguration on a Sunday? We transfer it to a Sunday because, uh, because we want a, a chance to observe public baptisms, uh, not only as a big celebration, but also with lessons that seem appropriate for that. And of course, we seek the bishop's permission to do so. Any questions or comments about that from the, from the, the community? All right. Well, if you think of some, by all means, share them. Let's read the story. Let's read the story of the transfiguration. Um, and let's start with, let me find it. Where are we? Where do I want to be? Hold on a second. Um, Hold on, here we go. All right, share screen. Let's start with Mark's version. Um, hopefully on the screen that you can see uh, Mark chapter nine verses 12, uh, two through 13. I'm gonna try to make that a little bigger. Nope, I'm not gonna try to make that bigger. Oops, I think I'm now opening something that I didn't wanna open. Hold on. There we go, a little bigger. All right, so let me read the text of Mark. Remember, Mark's gospel account is, as best we can tell, the oldest account in the form that we've got. Matthew and Luke pull largely from Mark in the telling of their story, and they change it and shift it in particular ways that suit the, the message that they, the good news they want to communicate. But I like to start with Mark and then go to Matthew and Luke and see what the differences are. But I'm going to read just the transfiguration story this is from Mark chapter nine, starting in verse two and going through the, verse 13. You'll see that the story ends with eight, but then there's another thing that happens right afterward that I wanted to capture. So, so let me read this for you. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them and his clothes became dazzling white such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice, This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. 
suddenly when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept the matter to themselves, questioning what this rising from the dead could mean. Then they asked him, why did the scribes say that Elijah must come first? He said to them, Elijah is indeed coming first to restore all things. How then is it written about the Son of Man that he is to go through many sufferings and be treated with contempt? But I tell you that Elijah has come, and they did to him whatever they pleased as it is written about him. What do you think about that? What, what catches your eye? What catches your ear? What are the words, the phrases, the details that, that strike you, either as being significant or perhaps a perplexing or, or maybe, even, um, maybe even confusing or, or surprising? What are, the, what are the details that are, are interesting to you in that reading of the story? Any, any comments or questions, anything, any, uh, any examples of, of text that, you, that you're drawn to? Verse 13, Rebecca says, yeah, I tell you that Elijah has come and they did to him whatever they pleased as it is written about them. Yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you. What else? Some of the physical details are always striking. I don't think they surprise me, um, but but they um, uh, they don't surprise me. But they're still uh, profound, right? The, the the physical, the white, the cloud, the light, uh, the appearance, um, high mountain. Just there's there's a real physicality to this to this story. Uh, I see somebody's. Uh, oh, uh, Susan, thank you, Susan Mays. I says tell no one. Thank you. Yeah, tell no one about this. Isn't that strange? Isn't that strange? You know, think about all the times when, uh, when Jesus does something and, and tells them to keep it a secret, to tell no one about it. There's something substantial about this. This seems to be such a huge event and yet, uh, and yet uh, asked to keep it a secret. Yes. Betsy uh, remarks, we seem to be in the middle of some uh, events. We seem to be in the middle of events, uh, some having already happened. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I, I wonder if, I wonder if uh, Betsy, that you're drawn to the, the first few words six days later. Um, imagine if I started a story and said, um, after these things, right, your English teacher will tell you not to begin a sentence with a conjunction or a therefore or however, um, or a quotation for that matter, because we want the reader or the hearer to make a connection. And yet, um, when we isolate these sayings as a, as a story, uh, we get an awkward beginning. Um, the, the, ru the rubrics for the, the rubrics for the lectionary uh, remind us that if, if, a, if a verse begins, if the first verse of the reading begins with a preposition or something else that's misleading to fill in the details. So if you were to look at this on the lectionary page, you would probably see six days, not six days later, but six days after, and then, and we'll get to it in a little bit, it'll tell us what, what, what happened before. That's up to the interpreter, right? That's not in the biblical text, but whoever's Whoever's, uh, whoever's introducing the reading, or perhaps as I do, sort of copying the, the lesson into the lectern so that whoever reads it uh, would give it some context. That's a, that's a dangerous bit of interpretation, but six days later, what does that mean? And sometimes it's clear and sometimes it's less clear, but, but absolutely. Yeah, thank you, Betsy. Um, yeah, so uh, hold on to those things. Just hold on to that. Um, the, 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 the basic structure is familiar, right? Jesus, along with three disciples, Peter, James, and John, and those three go together really well, right? Peter, James, and John, um, they're apart from themselves. He was transfigured, which means his figure meant his appearance changed, but it's not just like a costume change. There's something about his countenance that changes, the word transfigured. Um, his clothes become white. Interesting to me that his clothes become white. Um, this, this telling of the story doesn't talk about his his, his skin, at least explicitly, except that might be implied and transfigured, but we do get that his clothes became a dazzling white and comparatively uh, white as, as if no one on earth could bleach them. So that's how white they were. Um, we get Moses and Elijah, they're talking with Jesus. Peter's 
kind of a blunderous remark. Um, it's good for us to be here. And, and Mark adds this editorial remark. He didn't know what he was talking about. He was, he was terrified. Um, the cloud, the voice, no one with them but Jesus, and then coming down the mountain, the exchange about Elijah. So, so kind of hold on to that. Let's go ahead to Matthew's version. And I want you to look for what's different in particular. And I'm curious if Matthew's version will speak any more clearly to you than Mark's version did. So let me read the same story, but as Matthew has it for us. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three dwellings here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud a voice said, This is my son, the beloved. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground and were overcome by fear. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Get up and do not be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them, tell no one about the vision until after the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. And the disciples asked him, why then did the scribes say that Elijah must come first? He replied, Elijah is indeed coming and will restore all things, but I tell you that Elijah has already come, and they did not recognize him, but they did to him whatever they pleased. So also the Son of Man is about to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he was speaking to them about John the Baptist. Isn't it interesting how so much is similar and yet the, the differences, and many of them are slight differences. Some of them are pretty substantial, but the differences really stick out. The story's the same, right? Peter, James, John, Jesus, up on a mountain, transfigured, clothes shining, Moses and Elijah, Peter's blunders remark, a cloud comes, voice speaks, they go down, don't tell anybody the conversation about Elijah. That's all the same. But what do you notice? What are the details that you notice here? And, and perhaps perhaps reading this brings you back to the other text and helps something show up to you. What, what shows up to you as you hear this? Any details this time that stick out to you? Yeah, Rebecca goes back to verse 13, the difference in verse 13, right? Um, and it was 13 um, in Mark's version, right? Mark 13 is, I tell you, Elijah has come and they did to him whatever is pleased is written about them. Matthew's version is uh, actually in verse 12 here, but I tell you that Elijah has already come. They did not recognize him. That's different, but they did to him whatever they pleased. And then the Son of Man is about to suffer in their hands. But then also, um, Rebecca, right, in, in Matthew's version, verse 13, uh, this isn't in, in Mark at all. The disciples understood that he was speaking to them about John the Baptist. How did Matthew know that? Did he interview Peter? Did he interview James or John? Uh, or, or is Matthew, the editor, trying to help us understand what maybe hadn't been clear from Mark? Maybe Mark hadn't quite made that clear enough? Yeah, yeah, thank you. What, what, what else catches your attention? One thing that catches my attention is that Again, it begins with that six days later. There's something, this isn't just Mark stitching together of the story. Matthew seems to be stitching together the story in the same way. There's something about this event that took place, at least as far as Mark and Matthew are concerned, six days later. This is connected temporally. And I think because of that uh, repeated uh, emphasis on six days later, I think the connection is also consequential. There's a consequential connection between the transfiguration and whatever came first, which don't worry, we'll, we'll read about that more in a little bit. What else do you notice? Any other differences that stick out to you? Uh, his, his face shone like the sun, right? That wasn't in Mark, but I, 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 I sometimes I can't remember which version is which, right? Um, 
the order was different. Uh, this time we get there appeared to them Moses and Elijah. Last time there appeared to them Elijah with Moses. Um, that might not sound like a big difference, but but I, I bet there's something being conveyed here. There's something about this. Um, we, we think of Moses and Elijah. Moses seems to rank ahead of Elijah, if, if it's fair to say that there was any kind of ranking. Um, but, um, but, uh, but Elijah seems to be the subject at hand. Elijah seems to be the, the, the interested one, uh, the interesting one, because there's the conversation that happens afterward about, uh, right, about Elijah. Uh, Susan Mays notes, um, yeah, names John the Baptist. Is there significance that the story of Moses seeing the Lord in the burning bush has some connection or familiarity. Yeah, maybe that's a great that's a great sort of sermon idea. I wonder um, I wonder what the connection is between Peter, James, and John seeing Moses and Elijah, um, and Moses seeing God in the burning bush and encountering this in the voice in the cloud. Sure, sure. Uh, I'm sure there's some connection. I'm, I'm not sure I know what it is, but yeah, absolutely. There's an overlap. We're we're in the same realm. We're in the same the same spiritual kind of concept. Yeah. Um, uh, another detail, and I think I preached about this this year. I, I'm not, if I didn't preach about it, I thought about it because this came up uh, in our uh, lectionary. Jesus came and touched them. He touched them. Um, verses six and seven, uh, that touches in in Mark. Uh, the disciples fell to the ground and were overcome by fear, right? They're hiding, they're cowering. And in the midst of their cowering, uh, Jesus come and touches them, the physicality. God God wouldn't do that. God's spirit, right? But Jesus has a body. And so there's something about returning to the physicality of flesh uh, that is Jesus. Jesus comes and touches them. And when he does, tells them not to be afraid. And when they look up, they saw nobody except Jesus alone. It's, it's as if it's the, the, the touching brings them back into reality. I don't know uh, uh, what to make of that. But I, if I were the director of this movie, that would be something of interest to me. Yeah. All right, well, let's read Luke's version. Uh, and again, same questions. Uh, what's different this time? Um, and, and why does it matter? And what does it draw us to? And then we'll kind of expand the story out a little bit. We'll look at the rest of uh, what's surrounding text. Um, and then we'll also look at what Mal Malachi has to say about John the Baptist, excuse me, about Elijah. And then we'll look at some theological bits and also uh, last look at some art. So this is Luke's version. Now, and notice this comes in the, not at the beginning of a chapter, but in the middle, towards the end of chapter nine. Uh, before I say that, though, keep in mind that in, in the gospel text, there are no chapters or verses. That's added on later by translators and editors. Uh, when Luke wrote, uh, there were no chapters and verses. There weren't even paragraphs or sentences. It all kind of strings together. Um, so uh, so don't, uh, don't let that observation uh, feel any more definite than it, than it should be. It really shouldn't be uh, all that. Uh, all that significant, but I do think it's interesting to me that, that Mark and Luke kind of begin their chapters with transfiguration, excuse me, Mark and Matthew begin their chapters with transfiguration. Luke is building upon something. Uh, now, about eight days after these sayings, Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to him. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep, but since they had stayed awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Just as they were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. Then from the cloud a voice uh, came a voice that said, this is my son, my chosen, listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone, and they kept silent, and in those days told no one any of the things they had seen. What do you notice? What's different? Yeah, Betsy has a couple of things. She notes uh, eight days, not six, eight days. Did Luke get it wrong? Did Matthew and Mark get it wrong? Why would Luke say eight days? We'll talk about that. A uh, kept silent, not told to be kept silent, but they kept silent. Absolutely, Betsy, thank you for those uh, observations. Yeah, uh, in Matthew and Mark's version, Jesus tells them not to, not to talk about it. But in Luke's version, 
he knows that they did keep silent. He doesn't tell us that Jesus didn't tell them that. He omits that detail, but it conveys something a little different. Yeah, maybe, maybe in this version, maybe in Luke's mind, they were so overwhelmed by the experience that they recognized there wasn't something to be said. Yeah. Yeah. What else do you notice? What else do you notice? Uh, Marthy, I notice that he goes up on the mountain to pray. Thank you, Marthy. Yes, absolutely. Uh, Matthew and Luke don't tell us why he went up on, Matthew and Mark, excuse me, I keep making that mistake. Matthew and Mark don't tell us why Jesus went up on the mountain, but Luke tells us he went to pray and that it was while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed. Those praying details are left out of Mark and Matthew. I wonder if Luke wants to convey that in a different kind of way. Yeah. Um, Susan Mays, um, as always, Luke is softer in the delivery of the story and, and offers more details. Yeah, it's a, a beautiful pastoral presence. Yeah. Mark is my favorite, the Joe Friday of the gospel accounts. Just the facts, ma'am, just the facts. Matthew has a, a real kind of relationship with the historical people of Israel and, and is kind of uh, pretty sharp and harsh, especially when it comes to uh, non-Israelites. Um, Luke, uh, broadens that. He includes lots of Gentiles in his story and lots of encounters with Gentiles, some beautiful heart-pulling parables and stories uh, and songs and canticles. And here, here we see that as well. Yeah, that, that, that maybe pastoral side of Luke, that poetic side of Luke. Yeah. Um, you know, the whole, let me draw a couple other details. Notice in verse 31, right? Um, Luke fills in what Moses and Elijah and Jesus were talking about. In Matthew and Mark, they were just speaking. But here, Luke tells us they were speaking of Jesus's departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Luke wants to tie this story in the story to what's coming ahead, the, the departure. What an interesting way to describe crucifixion, resurrection, uh, ascension. Uh, but yeah, but Luke, Luke wants us to, to anchor that. So, so for Luke, Moses and Elijah are talking about about what's going to happen to Jesus, as if it's not just a sign that they would be with him, but that there's some kind of discourse between Jesus and these two great figures about what had to happen. Yeah, Fa a fascinating detail, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, Luke, Luke fills out so many other details. Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep, but since they had stayed awake, they saw Jesus's glory. No details about sleepiness in the other accounts. No sense in Matthew and Mark that if they had fallen asleep, they might have missed it. Luke gives us only because they stayed awake, even though they were sleepy, even though they were weighed down with fatigue, because they persevered, that, that, that feels like a different instruction to us. Um, if you were to preach a sermon on Mark or Matthew, you would have a hard time saying, the message of the transfiguration is to be encouraged despite difficulty and delay. Uh, if those who persevere will see the glory. But Luke allows that. Luke opens it up. I'm not saying that's what Luke's version is all about, but Luke adds that element. Yeah, so a different, a different opportunity uh, for preaching, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, notice in Luke's version, I don't think this is true in Matthew. I'm going to go back and look in a minute. But notice that the disciples entered the cloud, right? Did, was that true? Um, I guess it would say the cloud overshadowed them. So I suppose... I suppose then in some way, uh, it's reasonable to say that they entered the cloud. That was a, something that, that uh, I hadn't been clear to me. It feels often like Matthew and Luke in their own way, take what Mark said and kind of make it a little clearer. This, this is what Mark meant to say. This is what Jesus meant to say. This is what, what that meant. Sometimes those are editorial comments, um, right? Matthew offered the editorial comment uh, when he said um, uh, that, that, uh, that uh, Peter said to Jesus these things. Um, Oh, I can't remember where it was. Maybe it was Mark who added the editorial comment, right, about um, he said these things because they were terrified. Matthew has his own version of an editorial comment, but I can't remember what it is right now. Yeah. Um, and now Luke's version. All right. Um, would it surprise you to know that the transfiguration shows up all three years in the lectionary, A, B, and C, and that the transfiguration is the gospel lesson appointed for the last Sunday after the epiphany. So right before Lent starts, we read this. Doesn't that fit? Doesn't that fit well? Right? Uh, as we transition from 
uh, from the season of Epiphany, Epiphany, not in the theological sense, but in the psychological sense, Revelation, the season after the Revelation, right? There are a lot of miracles and other sort of moments where who Jesus is, is becoming clearer and clearer to Jesus's followers. This is kind of the culmination of that process. The epiphany of epiphanies, if you will, the, the fullest revelation of who a Jesus is. Um, uh, and, then, uh, and then we transition from this to Lent, right? The next Sunday is in the wilderness when the spirit speaks to Jesus. And so we're jumping around in the story to back and forth, but, but the transfiguration every year, the transfiguration always comes right before Lent. Um, maybe that uh, doesn't surprise you at all. What surprises me a little bit is that Luke's version is the one appointed for the Feast of the Transfiguration. So every year, we would actually hear this twice in public worship, once on the Sunday, uh, the last Sunday after the Epiphany, and the other one on August the 6th, whatever day August the 6th falls, we would imagine the community coming together for worship, and Luke's version would be the version we hear, which might be why you recognize Luke's version better. This is probably the version that we would read every uh, year as we observe the Feast of the Transfiguration on a Sunday. We would, we would skip to Luke's version. So this is probably the version that's most familiar uh, to us. Um, does that make sense? Questions or comments about that or anything else that we've discussed so far? If you're watching on YouTube, we're glad that you're here. If you're watching live, you can uh, join the Zoom conversation by uh, uh, finding the link in our weekly newsletter and navigating over to the webinar. Um, Betsy uh, remarks, uh, what, a, what a dreamy, cloudy quality of the whole experience. Absolutely, it's, um, it's otherworldly, right? This is, this is a moment where heaven and earth come together. And how do you get your hands around that? And, and maybe that's the reason Peter talks about making a dwelling, right? Which is to say, you can't, you can't capture this. You can't tabernacle this. This, this defies holding on to, and yet it's as near to you and real to you as, as Jesus' touch in, in, uh, in, uh, in Matthew's version. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, any other reflections? Well, I want to expand a little bit. What, what, oh, let me stop. I got a couple of comments. Yep, uh, Marthy. Marthy has read that this event occurred at night thinking about the darkness and the light of the transfiguration. What a wonderful, what a wonderful uh, contrast. I hadn't thought about it occurring at night, uh, but, but, um, but I wonder in my, in, in sort of the director's mind that I've always had, I imagine that cloud being, being uh, dark, you know, the, the light kind of dims a little bit, uh, heightening the, the drama of Jesus is shining. I hadn't thought about it at night, but I, I share with you that same sense in which, um, the same sense in which this, this light is, is particularly contrasted. Uh, Susan notes that before Lent is the reading from one of these gospels specifically. I was Luke, uh, good question. I'm sorry I didn't make that clear. In year A, which is the year we're currently in, it comes from Matthew. In year B, it comes from Mark. And in year C, it comes from Luke. So we go A, B, C, Matthew, Mark, Luke, Matthew, Mark, Luke, Matthew, Mark, Luke, uh, which is also a reminder there aren't that many stories that are in all three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. This is one of the miracles that is in all of them. Also, one of the reasons this story is, is strange is that this isn't a miracle that Jesus does. It's a miracle that happens to Jesus. I wonder what, I wonder what the significance of that is. Clearly, it happens to Jesus because of who Jesus is. Um, but, but Jesus doesn't sort of, it's not depicted to us as if he sort of waves a magic wand and shines. It, it almost feels like Jesus is participating in it the way that um, someone being healed might be participating in it. Or as we heard this Sunday, as Jesus walks out on the water, that's as much about the disciples uh, being ministered to as it is about Jesus. This, this though, is a, is a miracle that seems to catch Jesus up as well. Well, let's expand our, uh, our look and, and ask, what about what happened earlier? What happened before? Um, and I'm going to jump to Mark chapter 8. So, um, one of the beautiful things about Mark is, uh, is that it's, it's pretty simple. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, just the facts, ma'am, if you will. Um, Mark has 16 chapters, and it turns out that you can divide it in the middle right at chapter eight. The first eight chapters are basically the first half of Mark, and the second eight chapters are the second half of Mark. And if you read the whole thing cover to cover, I think you will discover, without any help from anybody else, that the first eight chapters of Mark are trying to figure out who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? Is he who he says he is? 
Who does he say he is? Who do disciples think he is? Who are we supposed to think he is? And all the way up through Mark, we get that. We get John the Baptist get bearing witness to him. We get the demoniacs bearing witness to him. We see miracles. We see teachings. Uh, we, see, um, we see dramatic moments. So we see all this where, where, where Jesus, Mark, is building a case for who Jesus is. Starting in Mark 9 through the end, it's no longer about understanding who Jesus is, but understanding the consequences of that. If Jesus is who he says he is, if Jesus is God's son, what's going to happen? And the answer is the cross, Jerusalem, the fate that, that awaits him here. Uh, the bit that, that I need help uh, understanding, because I don't know my Palestinian geography very well, but if you chart out all the places where Jesus goes, in the first eight chapters, Jesus kind of wandering around up north, Galilee, where he's from, kind of wanders around a little bit. But once we get to chapter nine, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem, and he doesn't do a lot of wondering. There are a couple of places where Mark seems to lose track of geography, but for the most part, once we get to the transfiguration, straight to Jerusalem. So the first half is about who is Jesus? Teaching, preaching, doing miracles, and the second half is, oh, that's who Jesus is? Now it makes sense. He's got to go to Jerusalem. There's got to be a showdown in Jerusalem. We don't know exactly what's going to happen, even though Jesus has told us over and over again, he's going to suffer, he's going to die, he's going to be raised again. But the rest of the second half of, of Mark pushes to the resurrection. And indeed, in Mark's account, the resurrection is the last bit. The, the tomb is empty. End of story. Uh, uh, cut to black, right? Um, so let me pull back to Mark chapter 8 and then transition to the transfiguration. And notice with me what, what Mark is building. And, and trust me when I say that Matthew and Luke also build the story out the same way. So in Mark chapter 8, in Mark's version, we've got the feeding of the 4,000. Remember, the feeding of the 5,000 happens first, 4,000 happens second. Notice, I'm just going to read the headings. Notice the demand for a sign, right? The, the religious authorities come and say, show us a sign of who you really are. Jesus warns the disciples about those who would seek a sign right? There's one last miracle. Let me read this. Um, Jesus cures a blind man at Bethsaida. This is the blind man that Jesus, look in verses 23 and 24. Jesus took the blind man by the hand, led him out of the village. When he had put saliva on his hands and laid his hands on him, he said, can you see anything? And the man looked up and said, I can see people, but they look like trees walking. Then Jesus laid his hand on him and he could see clearly. So this is the two you might remember from our study of miracles in other settings. This is uh, the moment when Jesus halfway heals the blind man. He can sort of see, but he can't see clearly. And then Jesus goes another step and he can see clearly. Now, if you think that's because Jesus had a bad day or didn't eat his Wheaties this morning, I bet you're missing the point. The point is sometimes we get to see what the truth is, but we can only see it vaguely only when we hang with Jesus long enough are we going to be able to see the truth. That's what Mark wants us to have in our minds as we get this. As soon as that miracle is over, as soon as the man's sight is clear, Jesus has this encounter with the disciples. When he asks the disciples, who do people say that I am? And the disciples answer, John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others one of the prophets. Then he says, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Messiah. This is the first time that any human has understood who Jesus is as the anointed one, the Messiah. Peter's the one who observes it. There's a feast in the church called the Confession of Peter. That's, that's what we remember. Jesus, Peter is the first one who, by the gift of the Holy Spirit, was able to put the pieces together and understand who he is. So Peter predicts, Peter understands him as the Messiah. Jesus says, don't tell anybody. And then look what Jesus does next. Jesus begins to teach them that a son of man must undergo great suffering, be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, the scribes, be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. You remember that part, right? You remember that part. Mark goes on, gives us a Jesus who calls the crowd together and says, if any want to, be, call my, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. We're not going to read that whole passage. But, but think about this. We've got demand for a sign. Jesus says, be aware of those who demand a sign. We've got the healing of the man from Bethsaida that comes in stages, half sight, full sight. Right after that, Jesus says, who do you think I am? Peter says, you're the Messiah. Jesus says, don't tell anybody about this. And notice the verb tense is the aorist or the imperfect. I think it's the imperfect. Uh, then he began to teach them that the son of man must undergo great suffering. This is the beginning. He's going to teach them that it's not over. He starts. The nature of Jesus' teaching changes. 
he begins to teach his disciples that the Son of Man must be rejected, must suffer, must die, and be raised again. Peter doesn't like it. Jesus rebukes him. And then Jesus expands his teaching to the whole crowd. If you want to be my follower, you've got to take up your cross and follow me. First time we see this. Notice then what happens in Mark chapter 8. I'm going to flip the page from Mark 9, 8 to Mark 9, and I'm going to make it a little easier for us to see, right? Truly, I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God has come with power. It's kind of the tagline at the end of that. But then we get the transfiguration. So six days later, if you read this passage on the lectionary website, you will see six days after Peter confessed Jesus as the Messiah, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. Mark, Matthew, and Luke all want us to see that the transfiguration of Jesus is a part of a sequence of events, and it kicks off with Peter's confession. Peter identifies Jesus as the Messiah. Jesus then explains the consequence of that. Because I am the Messiah, I will be rejected, suffer, killed, and be raised on the third day. The rest of it is us trying to figure that out. Uh, so the, 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 the key piece is the transfiguration is a response to that. Only now that Peter and the disciples are able to recognize Jesus as the Son of Man, as the anointed. Only now that they have heard Jesus predict what's waiting for him in Jerusalem, is it possible for this transfiguration to happen? In other words, the transfiguration couldn't have happened. It wouldn't have made sense in the gospel account if it didn't come where it comes, which is after Peter's confession. So if, if I were writing the introduction to this, I wouldn't say six days after Peter confessed Jesus as the Messiah. I would say six days after Peter confessed Jesus as the Messiah and after Jesus explained the consequence of that being that he would be rejected and killed in Jerusalem. Jesus took it with, but that's too wordy. You can't say that. But, but Mark intends for us to read the whole story uh, all at once. Mark doesn't want us to sort of pick and choose the way we do, the way we have to in the lectionary. But what do you hear there? What do you notice there? What, what changes when you think about the transfiguration? Let me go back to just the transfiguration. When you think about the transfiguration story and you think about how we celebrate transfiguration, and you think about what it means, does it change what it means to you when you see that it fits in inextricably six days later? All three of them have later. Luke has eight days. We'll get to that in a minute. Uh, but all of them temporarily tie it to Peter's confession, Jesus's prediction of his death and resurrection. Does that change the way you hear transfiguration? Did you know that? Did you remember that? I bet, I bet some of you did, of course. EFMers, those of you who've been studying this text in depth. But what, what do you think? What, what does that how does the proximity of this to Peter's confession and the first prediction of Jesus' suffering, how does that change the way you hear the story of the transfiguration? Doesn't it change, doesn't it change the nature of glory? Doesn't it change the nature of of this moment. I mean, if um, how easy it would be if your rabbi was transfigured before you to assume that that is a sign of that rabbi's crowning, that rabbi's uh, uh, future ascent to a heavenly throne, if you will. But for Jesus, the revelation of that glory, the disclosure of that glory only makes sense only gets through, can only be conveyed in the context of a passion prediction. Um, yes, Betsy goes in the other direction, not, not in an oppositional way, but in a beautiful way. Betsy reminds us that that means uh, the disciples are given hope that no matter what happens, the outcome will be good. Imagine, so I ask the question, what does the transfiguration look like if you haven't seen suffering? Uh, if, you, if you don't know that suffering is coming, you might misunderstand what glory is. Betsy asked the question from the other end, what's it like to endure suffering if you haven't seen the glory? Peter, James, and John had seen the glorification of Jesus in the transfiguration. So when they saw his death, there was a part of them, even if it wasn't a conscious part of them, there was a part of them that connected to this great event, a part of them that knew that no matter what happened, 
Jesus was still God with us, Emmanuel. That, that glory still shone through. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Betsy, for helping us ask that from the other. It's a great source, source of encouragement, of hope in the midst of struggle. Absolutely. What else? What else do you notice because of that connection with suffering? I think Luke, um, I think Luke actually ends up saying it well, right? Um, uh, Luke goes out of his way to note for us that Moses and Elijah were speaking with Jesus about his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. There's a connection with that departure. And Matthew, Luke, Luke talks about that. Matthew, though, Matthew's bit um, here in verse 9. Notice that Matthew says, uh, Matthew uh, gives us a Jesus who says to the disciples, don't tell anybody about this until when? Until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. There's a, a resurrection context. Uh, theologically, and we'll move to this now, theologically, we understand that the transfiguration is a moment when human beings, Peter, James, and John, were able to see the glory of the resurrected Jesus even before his death and resurrection. Um, let's read what, uh, this is, I'm going to warn you that the, uh, that the language here is cumbersome, um, because this is an ancient text. I need to scroll down because we've lost the, hold on, let me get to the end. We've lost, I've lost my spot. All right, so I want to read, this is Origen. Origen, the great, uh, ancient first, second century theologian who has some really remarkable and fantastical things to say about Jesus and about the gospel. Um, this is... Origen's commentary on Matthew. You can find it on the web. It's long. It's very long. But this is from Origen's commentary on Matthew. And this is from the part where he talks about the, the injunction of silence and, and the fact that Moses and Elijah are there. And I want to read, uh, I want to read most of this. Um, uh, and and I'll, I might edit some of the words as I read it because it, it's a little cumbersome. Uh, but after these things, it is written that when they heard the voice from the cloud bearing testimony to the sun, the three apostles, that is Peter, James, and John, not being able to bear the glory of the voice and the power resting upon it, fell on their face and besought God. For they were sore afraid at the supernatural sight and the things which were spoken from the sight. But consider if you can also say this with reference to the details in the passage that the disciples, having understood that the Son of God had been holding conference with Moses, and that it was he who said, a man shall not see my face and live. And taking further the testimony of God about him, as not being able to endure the radiance of the word, humbled themselves up under the mighty hand of God. But after the touch of the word, lifting the touch of the word, lifting up their eyes, they saw Jesus only and no other. Moses, the law, and Elijah, the prophet, became one only with the gospel of Jesus and not as they were formerly three, they did so abide, but the three became one. That is, law, prophet, Moses, Elijah, became one with Jesus. They, they, they don't, uh, Origen doesn't use language of fulfillment. He uses language of, of collapsing. They collapse together, if you will, that, that after Jesus touches them, law and gospel are present, but they're present in Jesus. That's the, the argument he's making. Um, um, let me skip down ahead and say, um, let's start here. This is probably a good place to start. Wherefore, the things that were said in the passage may be useful to us also for the passage before us, since Jesus wishes also, in accordance with these, that the things of his glory should not be spoken of before his glory after the passion. For those who heard, and in particular the multitudes, who would have been injured when they saw him crucified, who had been so glorified. Wherefore, since his being glorified in the resurrection was akin to his transfiguration and to the vision of his face as the sun. On this account, he wishes that these things should then be spoken of by the apostles when he rose from the dead. Origen, I, I'm pretty sure about this, Origen is the first theologian to connect in writing the uh, transfiguration with the resurrection. And that became kind of the pattern for us uh, for theological interpretation. Um, so, uh, Origen makes the connection between what the apostles saw in the transfigured Jesus and what they would see in the resurrection. Uh, and so that uh, Origen wants us to think resurrection glory when we see uh, the transfiguration mount. Um, again, not only connected with the suffering and the passion, but also the encouragement that comes after it. 
Let me read from one other uh, ancient uh, church figure. Um, this is from uh, Thomas Aquinas' Summa Theologia from the third part, question 45. This whole uh, page of the website has to do with the transfiguration. I'm not gonna read the whole thing, but you might remember that the Summa is in that form of objection and response. So uh, Thomas Aquinas uh, imagines these particular objections, theological objections to what he would say, and then he responds to them and he fills that out in this kind of beautiful um, deductive uh, uh, theology that is indicative of the, of the Catholic tradition, but, but not indicative of the Anglican tradition. We're, we're inductive by our reasoning. The Roman tradition is, is didactic, uh, 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 deductive in that way. But what I, what I, what I wanna show is the question that uh, Thomas Aquinas asks is, was it fitting that Christ should be transfigured? And I wanna read this answer. And then I wanna skip down and read uh, one more thing from the bottom. Uh, Thomas uh, Aquinas writes, I answer that our Lord, after foretelling his passion to his disciples, had exhorted them to follow the path of his suffering. That's what we read in uh, Mark and the same is true as you can see in Matthew. Now, in order that anyone go straight along a road, he must have some knowledge of the end. Thus, an archer will not shoot the arrow straight unless he first see the target. Hence, Thomas said, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Above all, is this necessary when hard and rough is the road, heavy the going, but delightful the end. Now, by his passion, Christ achieved glory, not only of his soul, not only of his soul, which he had had from the first moment of his conception, but also of his body. According to Luke, Christ ought, ought not Christ, to have suffered these things and so to enter into his glory, to which glory he brings those who follow the footsteps of his passion, according to Acts. Through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. Therefore, it was fitting that he should show his disciples the glory of his clarity, which is to be transfigured, to which he will configure those who are his, according to Philippians 3, who will reform the body of our lowliness configured to the body of his glory. Hence, B, the venerable Bede, says in his commentary on Mark 8, by his loving foresight, he allowed them to taste for a short time the contemplation of eternal joy so that they might bear persecution bravely. This is uh, perhaps related to what I think it was Betsy who said a little while ago. Um, this is so that as they endure the cross, they can make it to the resurrection because they've seen for sure that there's a glorious end. Uh, I might say that there are several moments where Jesus explains, don't give up, third day, be raised from the dead. But I love that language of the archer or of the traveler on a road. You can't go straight unless you've had a glimpse of the target or the end, especially when the path is difficult. The transfiguration, therefore, is a sign uh, for the disciples and thus for us of the truth of the resurrection that comes uh, after the crucifixion. Uh, how appropriate in this particular season of pandemic. I want to skip all the way down to the bottom and I want to read one more little bit because this is how I think that glory uh, comes to us. This is in response, um, uh, basically, when the father thunders from the cloud, this is my beloved son. Was that appropriate? And this is part of Thomas's answer. I answer that the adoption of the sons of God, think children of God, the adoption of the children of God is through a certain conformity of image to the natural son of God, that is Jesus. Now, this takes place in two ways. First, by the grace of the wayfarer, which is imperfect conformity. Second, by glory, which is perfect conformity. According to 1 John 3, 2, we are now sons of God and it has not yet appeared what we shall be. We know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. Since therefore it is in baptism that we acquire grace. While the clarity of the glory to come was foreshadowed in the transfiguration, Therefore, both in his baptism and in his transfiguration, the natural sonship of Christ was fittingly made known by the testimony of the Father, because he alone with the Son and the Holy Ghost is perfectly conscious of that perfect generation. So Thomas is saying that in the baptism, God spoke from the sky. In the transfiguration, God spoke from the cloud. God said the same thing twice. And we get transformed into that glory in part by the grace that works through us, but completely when the glory takes hold and is baptism by which that takes hold in us. That helps me begin to see the connection of baptism. Baptism, our baptism into Christ's death and resurrection is our baptism into that glory. I preached about this at evening prayer on Wednesday night when I spoke about how, uh, how when we look at one another and we see the face of Christ in one another, 
what I think we're invited to see is not the good works that one might do or the mercy and the love that one might have, but that glory, that brilliant shining as bright as the sun glory of Christ that lives within all those who have been baptized, who have been united to Christ. That when Christ is within us, that same glory that shone upon the Holy Mount shines from within us. Unfortunately, we're not able to see it much in this life, uh, but we know that we will see it fully in the next life. That's a part of our faith. So when we baptize a child, when we baptize an adult, when we baptize someone, we are uniting that person with Christ. Christ's nature, the divine nature that shone forth on the Mount of Transfiguration is engrafted by the Holy Spirit into the individual who's being baptized. The, the human nature is united with the divine nature. And when the human and the divine are united to each other, something has to give. And it's not the divine nature that gives, it's the human nature that is burnished, changed, sanctified through a lifetime until that glory can shine fully. The fact that Jesus lets us, God lets us see Jesus's glory, not only on the other side of resurrection, but even in this life helps us know that in this life, not only on the other side of resurrection, but even in this life, we are already able to participate in that glory that shines through. And it encourages us to endure to the end that even if the road is tough, we have already seen not only in Christ, but in ourselves and our own baptism, the truth that awaits us. That's weighty uh, theological uh, stuff, but I, I offer it to you because it's a big deal. This, this transfiguration is a big deal and I'm sorry that we're not able to celebrate that on a Sunday, which is one of the reasons that I wanted to do this. All right, as we finish our time together, I hope you've enjoyed it. I wanna show you some art, uh, some of the ways. There are so many ways that the Transfiguration is depicted in art. Um, it's been a common focus in Christian art. Let me show uh, you some examples of uh, the Transfiguration in art. Um, this is a mosaic. Uh, it's a mosaic from the apse of St. Catherine's. Um, it is uh, probably the earliest artistic representation of the Transfiguration. It was completed around 565 AD. That's the sixth century. Let me point out for you. Here in the middle, of course, we've got Jesus. And then on Jesus's right, our left, you can see the Greek there is Isaiah. So that's Elias, Elias, excuse me, Elias. That's Elijah. And here on Jesus's left, our right is a Moses. That says Moses there. So we've got Elijah and Moses. And at the bottom, we've got Ioannis, which is uh, John. We've got Petros, which is Peter. And we've got Yako, which is, um, Yakos, which is uh, James, Jacob, James, same word. And so here in the apse, we have this presentation. Uh, notice the rays of light that are streaming from Jesus. Notice that Moses and Elijah are offering signs of benediction. Notice that the disciples are uh, struck by this. They're sort of in awe of this, except maybe for Peter, who kind of looks like he's reclining, uh, maybe looking up. Um, something more to be said about this. Um, but, but sixth century, very early representation. Um, I wanted you to see that. Uh, let me skip here. This is an icon from the 15th century. Uh, probably the icon that you're, if you're familiar with any icons of the Transfiguration, probably the one you're most familiar with. This is a Theonophis uh, icon, again, 16th century. I'm going to zoom in if I can figure out how to make this work. I'm not sure it's going to let me. Let's see if I can make this work. Can I do that? Yeah. Can you see that, I bet? All right. So we've got Jesus again with Moses and Elijah there at the top. Um, notice the skin tones. This is from the Eastern Church. And so they would have depicted Jesus as Jesus probably would have lived, right? This is probably closer to what, uh, what kind of skin tone Jesus would have had. But I think it's, it's important for us to remember that in the ancient church, in the Eastern Church, and indeed in the Palestinian Church, uh, that Jesus would have looked like a Palestinian, uh, not like an Anglo. Um, but here we've got Moses and Elijah, right? They're sitting, standing next to Jesus. They're hovering. You can tell they're on a mountain. But there's also this kind of hovering. Jesus seems to have left. Jesus seems to have left the bottom of the mountain. This this glorification uh, involves his his levitation, if you will. Notice clearly light shining forth, white robes, offering the sign of benediction, holding something in his hand. Interesting. And then if we scroll down to the bottom, you can see uh, Peter, James, and John there at the bottom. 
right? A covering their faces, only one is looking. I can't see the Greek to know, but I think that's Peter. I think in this depiction, Peter's on the left, John is in the middle, and James is on the right. I'm not 100% sure about that. The colors historically of Peter, James, and John have represented faith, hope, and love, the three great uh, Christian virtues. Um, and so we see that depicted there. Uh, and then we see the saints who are looking on from, uh, from either side. Uh, and I don't, I don't know enough to tell you exactly what they are, but you can see some uh, holes in the mountain as if something is broken free. So this is, a, this is the, the icon, 15th century icon um, of Theophanes. Um, you can find all these online. This is the, the first two images I've shown you are public domain. Um, uh, uh, let me show you another. Ooh, I think I might be glitching. Hopefully you can still see. I bet you recognize this. This is uh, Raphael's last painting uh, commissioned uh, by one of the uh, Medici's, um, commissioned for a cathedral. You can see this in person. Uh, it is a large piece, uh, over 10 feet uh, tall. Um, and you can see, and this is traditional, that this representation of the, uh, of the transfiguration is divided in half. The upper half, you can see the familiar images of Jesus, Moses, and Elijah, as well as the three apostles who are there. Over here on the left, let's see if I can zoom in there. Over here on the left, you can see two figures who are thought to be the patron saints of the cathedral uh, where this was uh, written. And I'm pretty sure those saints, lesser saints, uh, had their feast day on August the 6th. So for the reasons they might've been included. Uh, but notice here at the bottom, notice at the bottom what's going on. It's another episode that while Jesus, Peter, James and John are on the mountain for the transfiguration, What's happening down below? Uh, the disciples are attempting to cure a demon-possessed boy. The demon-possessed boy is over here on the right with his arms stretched out in the arms of his father and mother. And you can see his eyes are blank and his mouth is open to suggest that he's still demon-possessed. He's surrounded by a crowd who are seeking uh, healing. And in the middle and to the left of the figure are the other disciples. And if you count them, there are nine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nine of them. Um, who, uh, who are trying their best to get this demon out, but they're not able to. And if you read in the gospel accounts, as soon as they come down the mountain, they are met by this father and the son. And Jesus says to them, oh, you sinful and perverse generation, excuse me. And then Jesus does what the disciples were unable to do, which is to cast out the demon. They ask him, why were you able to cast this one out? And they said, demons like this can only be cast out by prayer and fasting. But those two episodes, the, the issue of the demoniac and the transfiguration are united. And it seems theologically that they represent heavenly and earthly, right? Um, that in the heavenly realm, uh, Jesus is, is, his glory is breaking through. In the earthly realm, however, uh, we're still stuck. And we look for Jesus as the place where these two things come together. So Raphael uh, depicts this beautiful thing. There, there's actually some interesting videos you can find on YouTube, uh, some art historians who will walk you through in more detail uh, the, the imagery and the creation and the, the work itself. So if, if you're interested in learning more, you can search Raphael Transfiguration and, uh, in YouTube and you'll find some videos. I've got two more images that I want to show you. This is, not, uh, um, this is not a public domain. This is a photograph taken by a Brother Lawrence. Uh, he has shared this and allows it to be shared as long as we give a credit. So indeed, this is Brother Lawrence. Uh, Brother Lawrence took this picture of the upper sacristy of the Basilica of the Natu National Shrine of the Immaculate Conception in Washington, D.C. That's a basilica, the foundation of which was laid in the early part of the 20th century, but of course completed later than that. And you can see in the image, the quotation across the top, Lord, it is good for us to be here. Matthew 7, 4, Jesus with Moses on one hand holding the tablets of the law. You can see the the, 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 the horns of light shining. I keep a little Moses on my desk and you can see the horns uh, coming out of his head. I'm trying to get my beard as long as Moses's beard. I've got a little ways to go yet, but you can see Moses here on Jesus. This time Jesus is right and Elijah on Jesus is left with a prophetic scroll. You can see Peter, James, and John below, but this is a more, uh, uh, of course, a, a far more recent depiction of the transfiguration. And you can see the quotation at the bottom, blessed are your eyes, for many just men have longed to see the things that you see and have not seen them. Uh, doesn't actually attach itself to the transfiguration, but another verse of Jesus, 
uh, that, uh, that, that helps us unpack this. So you can see this picture. Uh, the last image I wanted to share, um, there is not a license to share it, so I didn't want to download it, but I wanted you to see this. Oh, yep. Um, I wanted you to see this image. Let's see if I can get back to it. This is an artist, and the artist's name is Venzislav Pirianakov. Um, I'm not sure I got that right, but this artist was born in 1971, so clearly 20th or 21st century art. Um, he does a lot of uh, sacred depictions, and you can see here the image of Jesus. Uh, being flanked by Moses and Elijah, though it's a little harder to tell which is which. Perhaps the one on Jesus' left is Moses because he looks like he's holding a tablet. You can see doves sitting on Jesus' shoulders, which is an interesting depiction. And of course, Peter, James, and John. What I love about this particular depiction, and you can find it uh, if you uh, Google um, uh, painting, transfiguration, Christian art, you can find uh, this work. Um, what I love is just how bright the center is. This really helps me understand the light is so bright that I can't even tell where Jesus's body is, only his hands are visible. And I really appreciated that, that kind of overwhelming experience of the transfiguration. So as we finish up, I wanna uh, just wrap everything up and say that the transfiguration is one of our big moments. It's not a principal feast in the life of the church, but it's one of those few feasts that in addition to the principal feasts would take precedence of a Sunday. When it doesn't fall on a Sunday, we like to transfer it to Sunday in order that we might hear that lesson and those stories in the context of baptism. And when we baptize someone on the transfiguration, we are seeing that glory, not with our eyes, but inside the one who has been united to Christ's glory. So that even with the struggle that will come, even the death that we know will come, on the other side of it will be glory, will be resurrection. So we, we hold on to all of that so much far too much for us to, to really uh, grasp just in the context of a sermon or a service. So it's really been kind of fun for me to explore this with you. I'm glad you've been a part of the session today. This is a one-time offering, one time only. Uh, next week is our kickoff Sunday, and I'm going to start a series on science and theology. I'm going to look at some of the subjects that a scientifically uh, informed or literate society might a question about the Christian faith. And the topic is being Christian, uh, in a scientific world, uh, and I hope you'll join me. I, I'm, I'm not a scientist, but I do like the sciences, and I hope that'll be a fun exploration for us. So starting next week, a series on science and theology. I'm glad you've been with us. Good to have you here. Let's finish our time together today by praying the prayer that Jesus has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Glad you're with us. Thank you for joining us on the, uh, on the Zoom webinar and also those who've watched on YouTube. You can share this uh, with others and hope you'll come back next week. I wish you well and I look forward to seeing you soon.